really hit a low point with my mental health in college. I just started getting a lot of breakouts all over my face. I was super stressed out, a lot of self-hatred, feeling very hopeless where I didn't even know what the point of living was anymore. Jisoo Kim, you're a Korean American health and wellness content creator. You graduated from USC as a pre-med student with the intention of becoming a doctor. My mom is a single parent. She raised me and my brother. Growing up, I felt a lot of responsibility to be a, a really good student, be a good daughter, because there was so much pressure on me. I never really expressed all of the hurt and pain that I was experiencing. It started manifesting in a very unhealthy relationship with food and with body. Last year in 2022, you walked away from medical school. You decided to start working at a grocery store. Why while starting your wellness account from a brand new account. People laugh at me and I remember it was pouring rain outside and it was my time to bring in the cart. I had like 3,000 followers. I had spent many months creating content. I was like, what am I doing with my life? It was such a low low and I felt so embarrassed not giving up on your dreams of continuing to pursue it. Honestly, my story could be a movie. It's crazy. Do you know where your dad is at? What he's up to? Perfect. Okay, I'm gonna hit record now. Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome to happy hour. We are outside, outdoors, in my guest's backyard, which Woo! I've seen in so many of your YouTube videos, but <laughs> to be in it. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful day. Oh, it it's really sunny. Is. It was so gloomy before, and then the sun just came out Absolutely. for this podcast. I'm so grateful. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Melissa. Yes, that's me, I'm the host. I'm so grateful you're spending happy hour with me and my guest Jisoo today. And this is a show where I spotlight wonderful API talent such as yourself and I really wanna expand the show to not just talking about our career, our work ethic, but really expanding the boundaries of how API talent are perceived. I'm so glad that this episode is happening because I DM'd you because I have to say, you are a gifted natural storyteller. Aww. If I, so, wow. let me put that out because you are a um, a wellness content creator, and mm -hmm. I want to just do a little summary about how you ventured into the space. But being a content creator in the wellness space requires a lot of vulnerability. When I was looking at your reels, when I was looking at your posts, I have never DM'd a person and been like, "Hey, I just." wanted to say that your work is amazing. I feel really inspired by you. I feel like you're the only person I've DM'd where wow. I've reached out and I was like, Jisoo, your story is no so way. incredible. You know what's crazy? When you DM'd me, I thought you just were so naturally outgoing and bubbly and you did this to everyone, you know? You were outgoing enough to just DM people that you really connected with and appreciated. So I am just really honored that it meant even more than I thought it was, you know? Yeah. It, I felt like it was a very organic connection. Yeah. And when I decided to relaunch the podcast, I was like, I want to get more into the wellness mental health space. And you're obviously the perfect person to have on the show. Let's do a little um, summary for the listeners on who you are. So your name is Jisoo, Jisoo Kim. You're a Korean American health and wellness content creator based here in LA. And you graduated from USC as a pre-med student with the intention of becoming a doctor. Mm -hmm. I think we all know sort of the reasons why. I think being Asian American, there's a lot of those cultural, social standards. Um, and also in your unique situation, you're a, a child of a single immigrant parent. And so I think that mm -hmm. definitely factors into the types of jobs that your family or you think are best for you and your family. Yes. Once you hit senior year, that I would say is like your turning point. Mm -hmm. You discover natural holistic wellness. That year you also started going to therapy mm -hmm. and you said it was to heal from your past childhood trauma. Yes. And that was also the year where you kind of had this manifesto that working in a hospital, treating patients within those hospital walls, that's not your calling. Your calling is to inspire thousands of women online in the wellness space. Honestly, it, it feels so amazing that what you thought you were meant to do, you were meant to do bigger, like you were made for more in terms of your calling and your career. So last year in 2022, you walked away from medical school, which is definitely such a big decision I can imagine. Oh, yeah. And you had such, you also had the courage to say like, I if I wanna work towards my goals, I have to start somewhere. And I think listening to your story, it it feels like a very humbling experience because mm -hmm. you walked away from you uh, from medical school and you had this illustrious USC degree and you started you decided to start working at a grocery store yeah um while starting 
your wellness account from a brand new account Mm -hmm. from zero from zero followers and I have to say in your store you say that after a year you're doing this full time now you have over a hundred thousand followers on Instagram organic followers but in one of the reels that I saw you said that you grew to a hundred thousand in three months is that correct yeah that is so crazy. So people don't know that I actually had 4,000 followers in the beginning of this year on January 1st. What? I created my account in February 2022. Uh-huh. The entire year I was creating content, working at a grocery store, pursuing this dream, this crazy dream I had. And at the end of 2022, I almost had a mental breakdown. I almost wasn't going to post this one thing that literally took off my career and made me go viral, which is um, a healthy girl habits challenge that I did on January 1st to January 7th. And that is what kind of took me off, went from 4K to 30K in less than a week. And ever since then, up until January to March, I grew from 4K to 100K. Wow. So it's been a crazy journey and so mind blowing and very unique to me and such a humbling experience, like you said. Yeah. Yeah, that is so insane that you just never know Mm-mm. really what will happen. I think in, in my situation, it's like I definitely put a lot of work into happy hour now that I've relaunched it. And sometimes I think slow growth can be really frustrating. And I'm sure yes. throughout those pro- the process of like staying stagnant at a specific follower count. And sometimes mm-hmm. like people are like the followers don't matter. It's like numbers don't matter. But in a way, like it, it really does is still a metric of success in terms of content creation. But one day, just yeah. out of sheer, you know, divine intervention, it's like that one specific video, that one specific post, it could change your life. And so yeah. that's really encouraging to hear that, like being consistent with your posts, if you want to go into the content creation space is really important. Yeah. Um, and also just sharing being vulnerable as well. I feel like that is what really will connect you with your audience. Absolutely. And so after a whole year now, you're doing this full time now. You are not working at a grocery store. No, I'm not. But people who do work (laughs) at a grocery store, that is a very noble profession. Yes. But you're able to do this full time now. And that is incredible. And I want to talk about the the brands that you've partnered with. (laughs) You've since partnered with some top wellness brands such as, is it Osea Skincare? Osea. Osea, they have really great like collagen body lotion they have collagen body lotion they have body oils they have moisturizers gua sha everything i've been to one of their wellness events and (gasps) what i love most about this brand is the people behind it they are Mm -hmm. so kind and genuine and you can just tell that They just have a passion for what they do and they're very down to earth and the people that they invited, there were people of color. Mm. I saw people who looked like me and I saw other people of color and that was so refreshing because I think in the wellness space, a lot of the times I feel like I'm the only one that's representing, you know, but it was so beautiful to see that at Osea, they understood, you know, the assignment that we need to have more diversity and all of that so absolutely love that brand i love hearing that like you get to also see the people that you work with because sometimes as content creators you just partner with people and your only interaction with them is like through an email so Mm -hmm. it's really nice that they're able to also host these local events where they value the talent that they're working with Uh, so that's one of the brands and you're also working with symbiotica which is this amazing vitamin supplements brand Mm -hmm. and you love drinking their matcha which I'm always seeing you drink their matcha like first (laughs) thing in the morning yeah Um, you recently did a talk at Artha which is this wellness sanctuary based in LA Mm -hmm. and you've also been able to meet so many amazing lifestyle wellness creators those are just some a few of the many achievements that you've accomplished so far within this year of building your your wellness brand but in the end I think what really is fulfilling for you is that you're inspiring thousands of women like I said to become healthier to become happier to become better at more in tune with their mental health and Mm -hmm. also creating a space for Asian Americans to tell them that it is a possibility to be in this space you are really a gifted storyteller so I think this platform is it just feels like it makes sense that you are in this space Mm. before we start Mm -hmm. I brought some drinks because it is happy hour and to fit the theme of wellness I got these drinks at Whole Foods it's from the brand Urban Remedy and I have two flavors this one has um, chlorophyll lemon and monk fruit and then that one has turmeric lemonade and so since you're 
my guest today. Please pick which one speaks to you more. <laughs> Ooh, honestly, I want to try the the green one. The green one, yeah. Okay, love. So I'm gonna shake this, and then we're gonna have a bit of a sippy sip. Ooh, let's see. I've never tried this. I'm very excited. Me as well. I always love. I think one of the, my favorite things about being in the wellness space is geeking out about all of these wellness brands. There's so many. <laughs> yeah, it's just so surreal to be doing this. That's amazing. I'm gonna I'm gonna put the mic between my legs so I can <laughs> open this. Um, Do some ASMR. Oh, wait, I don't know if it opens. Oh, hopefully they heard that. <laughs> okay, cheers, Jason. Cheers we'll see. to wellness. Cheers to wellness. Ooh, I love anything with turmeric mm. or with ginger. Mm. Well, that's good. Maybe it's a brand that Urban Remedy, you should work hey, with Ur Jason. Hey, Urban Remedy, hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to emphasize too much about like the story of how you uh, came into full-time wellness because I kind of summarized it already mm -hmm. but I do want to talk about more of um when you were in a in a very low spot in your life in terms of really being stressed really being depressed about the career that you thought was meant for you mm -hmm. and having a lost sense of direction could you tell me what you were feeling in that moment and specifically like how did that manifest in your body physically at that time yeah so i guess i should start off by saying i grew up in a single parent korean immigrant household my mom is a single parent she raised me and my brother mm -hmm. and growing up i felt a lot of responsibility to be a, a really good student be a good daughter because there was so much pressure on me and i never really expressed all of the hurt and pain that i was experiencing and i kind of kept it all in and it wasn't until I hit college where it started manifesting in a very unhealthy relationship with food and with body very obsessive I felt that my worth was based on the size of my body or what I could control with food and all of that it also led to a lot of anger and a lot of outbursts within my family and I think that's something a lot of people don't talk about is how when you're hurting, oftentimes, in my case, I put it out onto my family. You would go out and I would be this loving, kind, outgoing person. But then in front of my family behind closed doors, I was very angry. I was always impatient. I always have anger outburst, And I wasn't the best sister to my brother. And I wasn't the best to my mom. On top of that, I really hit a low point with my mental health where I started really hating myself and thinking that all the things that had happened to me were a result of me, even though it wasn't. And eventually in college, I just started get, getting a lot of breakouts all over my face. I was super stressed out. I was very unhappy with my life. And even on the outside, I had this perfect picture of my social media, you know, you would go on vacation to Australia or I would go skiing with my friends, but on the inside, I'd be so miserable. And I had a low point where I didn't even know what the point of living was anymore. And so I think it manifested in just, just a lot of self-hatred and feeling very hopeless and not being excited for the future and feeling very unhappy with myself and not understanding why I couldn't stop hurting other people that I loved. Mm. Gil, can you tell me more about the relationship you had with your mom and your brother and how that was like? How, how, how has that changed till, till now? It's made a complete 180. Mm. For my brother, there was a lot of pain that we both experienced, but we expressed it in different ways for him he kept it in and he was very quiet and stoic so he didn't like to express his emotions versus me if I'm hurting I want you to know that I'm hurting mm. and so I would just say very negative things to him or honestly sometimes this is me being, being very vulnerable but sometimes even gaslight him you know and just be very emotionally or with my words almost abusive you know mm. because I was hurting so much and you know obviously as siblings like you say mean things mm -hmm. you kind of you know joke around and stuff but I think for a very long time I felt very angry and bitter at him for not being the brother that I needed and he is he a younger brother or an older? he's an older brother mm. I always felt like the older sister the one that was taking care of the family the one that 
was kind of like the star of you know the family I always had great grades I was going to a great school and my brother was kind of the one who was trying out different things and whatnot so I felt that he wasn't the older brother that I wanted him to be mm. when in reality I was placing this unrealistic expectation of him and it wasn't fair so now I see him for who he is and I don't have those expectations and I don't have this unrealistic standard of who he needs to be. And I allow him to show me love in the way that he wants to, instead of forcing him to show me love in the way that I want him to. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. And how about you and your mom then? Me, my mom, I would say growing up, she didn't know that I was hurting so much. So she didn't understand why I would have these anger outbursts. Maybe mm. she thought I was just going through hormonal changes as, you know, a teen, but I held a lot from her and it wasn't until I started going to therapy and it was actually very interesting because when I finally told my mom I was doing therapy again, she asked me, why do you need to do therapy? She was kind of telling me like, I didn't need to do it. You seem fine. You're, you're going to a great school. Everything is mm -hmm. going for you. But she told me later on that she was saying that because when I was young, we, one of um, the people or I think it was a therapist or someone like that was telling my mom that later on in life, we like me and my brother were going to need therapy for what we've been through. And my mom, like that kind of came back to her and she felt so guilty thinking that I was going to therapy for all the things that had happened when in reality, like I wasn't trying to blame her or anything. So I just kept a lot of distance from my mom. I didn't really tell her what I was feeling internally, but I think now I'm so much more open about my mental health with her. I'm very open that I go to therapy. And I think also just sharing my stuff online, she's able to see my experience through my eyes mm. in a way that she's never seen before because I am very vulnerable on my social media mm -hmm. more than the typical like wellness, you know, that girl person. And she's, been able to hear things that I've never told her before and I think we have this mutual respect now that I'm pursuing my actual passions she can fully support me and fully just be there for me and I also don't have that bitterness towards her anymore like I understand her as more of an adult seeing what she's gone through and understanding that she did the best she could mm. and kind of forgiving both myself and people within my family yeah so I mean, forgiveness is one of the hardest things that we can do. Was there a specific moment where, you know, like you sat down with your mom and your brother and you said, and a lot of these things you unpacked with them or how did forgiveness look like in your life, in your relationship with them? Mm. I definitely had to first forgive myself oh, because yeah. the reason I was treating them so horribly was because I hated myself. And I think therapy and my wellness journey allow me to develop more self-love for me and not put the burden of all the things that I've been through on me and realize that I also did the best I could. And so for me, forgiveness was, I think, just an internal thing. Internally, I forgave my family, but it was the way I treated them, the way that I respected my mom, the way that I let more of her into my life, was more open and honest about how I was doing. I think for my brother, it was instead of allowing these tiny things that were upsetting me to just simmer and then being snarky about it to be like, hey, this is what I need or this is what I'm thinking about this situation. What are your thoughts about it? So we would have more open communication, which is very difficult in an Asian household to <laughs> express your emotions and say, hey, what do you think about this? I'm sorry I hurt you. Or how can I better show up X, Y, or Z? It was very difficult to just start expressing emotions and being more vulnerable. But I think that was a way I was able to show my mom and my brother that I had forgiven them and that I actually wanted to build this relationship. Hmm. It takes a lot of definitely courage to, I mean, in general, just open up in, in a household that doesn't usually prioritize mental health because I think it's really just a generational thing too. It's like, I mean, our parents, like my, my parents, like for, for example, my mom, she grew up dirt poor. And so there was definitely a lot of like so much trauma back then that I don't think in her mind, in her generation, she doesn't really contextualize that as trauma. She just contextualizes that that was just a part of life. Mm -hmm. So she definitely brought a lot of, I think, being super gung-ho about things. I definitely think she has put that in my life, which I thank her because I feel like I've become much a much more stronger person. And I feel like in times of stress, I'm able to like deal with stress with, with level-headedness. But 
yeah, I think at times, like, it, I feel like only until recently, and also really inspired by you too, that I'm like, you know what, I kind of want to be more vulnerable online. And from the few times that I've done it so far, people have messaged me and be like, oh, like, thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. And so talking more about your family, growing up, was it just your mom in the picture? Like, do you know where your dad is at? Like, what he's up to? Yeah, so this is actually very interesting because... I grew up not really talking about my family, even my closest friends. They would be like, wait, you have a brother? And that's how secretive I kept my family. And I've always shifted the focus towards my career or what I wanted to be or my school or who I am. And I never really shared my family because it was so personal to me. But I I do know my dad. I do have a relationship with him. So my mom and my dad, they separated when I was very young and they were both they're both living in South Korea they were born there I was born there as well Mm. so they divorced and my mom moved to America and I went with or I was like taken with her when I was around five years old and what was the decision for your mom to come to the states she um, I think I get this a lot from her but she just wanted freedom for her life she wanted to make her own decisions of what she wanted to do Mm. and in Korea There is a lot of pressure to be very close to your family in the sense where everyone has an opinion as to what you should be doing. And oftentimes the grandma or the mother-in-law has a really big input on Mm. the family. And my mom just wanted to kind of create her own life and not have anyone else's input on what she was going to be doing with her life and X, Y, or Z. So she moved to America and she's always wanted to do that. And I am actually ready to share more about my personal life. So my brother stayed behind with my brother. I mean, my brother stayed behind with my dad. So Mm. my dad and my brother, um, and it was me and my mom. So that was kind of the deal. And it wasn't until later on that my brother actually joined me, my mom, in America. It was his his own decision to come and um, live with you. There's two? parts that I don't feel comfortable sharing just yet, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but eventually my brother did come to America and join us, and that was around middle school when he was in middle school. I believe I was also in middle school as well, and so I think that's kind of the reason we're not super close. There's kind of a cultural difference, a cultural gap. I've always grown up with my mom, and yeah, we kind of grew up in a single parent household. And it wasn't until recently, last year, I visited Korea. I visited before several times, but this time I really wanted to build my relationship with my dad because mm. I'd only seen him a couple times and he loves me so much you know but he could tell that I was very distant because how can you love or miss someone that you didn't really grow up with you know even if it is your blood but I knew that I did want to have a relationship with my dad and it was the most beautiful thing where I went to Korea and for the first time I saw my dad not as this stranger and just this person like father figure but I saw him like through my eyes I saw I look exactly like him my brother looks like my mom and I look like him and I always joked when I was growing up like mom did you adopt me because I don't look anything like you and like my brother but then when I went to Korea and I visited my dad's side of the family like my dad's um, sister like my aunts and uncles I resembled so much of them and I think that was such an epiphany and such an uh, enlightening moment and I saw his personality I saw so many parts of me that were so similar to him, even though we didn't even grow up, you know, like I have his nose, I have his eyes, his perspective on life. is just so amazing. Like he just trusts me and my brother to do what we want with our life versus my mom was more of that tiger mom who was like, do this, do that. So I was able to spend a lot of quality time with him because yeah, it was just the first time that I got to spend time with him, like as his daughter. And I think that was the first time I, I actually saw myself in that way. And I kind of just made a decision from that point that I wanted to, as much as I could, go back to Korea every year to Mm, build that, mm -hmm. especially after all these years of not having that bond or having the time with him. Yeah. Um, But yeah, that's Mm -hmm. it's a lot that I've just shared. It's not very open that I talk about all the time, but I feel healed enough and in a really good place where I do feel comfortable to share what I have just shared. That's amazing. Speaking of your dad, it's like, was it your intentional choice that you that you told your family, like, I actually want to get to know my dad more? And when did that when was that time where you made that decision? You know, I didn't. I 
was very resistant because I had an image of who he was and I was very scared. And there's other parts of my story that I haven't shared that I'm not comfortable yet. Mm. I think maybe in a couple years I will share it because I think honestly my story could be a movie or turn into book <laughs> yeah. because it's, it's crazy. I've only shared a little bit about it, but it was actually my mom who pressured me to wow. spend quality time because me and my mom went together to Korea to visit our family and we were staying at my, my mom's side of the family, but she was the one, she's always wanted me to have a relationship with my dad, which is something in hindsight that I have so much respect for. And so she kept pushing me to spend time with him to go over and, you know, stay at my dad's place on my own. And I didn't want to, I was nervous, I was scared. And then I finally did it. And it completely changed like my life, like my dan- my dynamic with him, but I didn't want to initially. And it was actually my mom who basically forced me to spend time with him. Mm. Can you remember that, I guess that initial first encounter that you had with your dad, was it just an instant connection that happened? How was that like seeing him after so long? I mean, I met him when a couple times before when I went to Korea, cause this isn't my first time that I've w- been to Korea. So I saw him um, maybe when I was in middle school, I believe, and I don't remember too much from it. I think my brain just kind of evaporated everything and kind of went into shock. But I just remember not really knowing who this stranger was, but feeling like I was obligated to, you know, like be his daughter or be a part of his family. So it was very weird in the beginning when I was younger. And I think the reason why last year I was able to have such a great experience is I am an adult now, you know, I'm 23. I've processed and gone through therapy for the past year and a half. And it was specifically for a lot of it was my childhood trauma and what I've been through. So I was able to process everything and come to a lot of conclusions and a lot of peace. And I think I came into that with a whole different perspective and a whole different mindset. Mm -hmm. And I think it was just as I spent more time with him, I grew to be more comfortable. And I think this is such a beautiful thing. But for the first time when we went our separate ways, obviously, by the end of my time with him, it was the first time where I was really sad. And I and I didn't I like wanted to spend more time with him. Mm, that's and such a beautiful feeling to feel yeah, sad because you care about him. Yeah, but that had never been the case before. It was always, oh, my gosh, like I'm ready to go home or I'm like ready to get out of here. So I think that was such a beautiful moment and I hope I can build on that for sure. Mm. And you were talking about how therapy really, really helped you. So I've actually never had therapy at all in my life. And I feel like it was always something where I thought I don't need it. Therapy also at this point, it's like, it's not something that I think I can commit to at the time financially, but Um, it's just been something where I feel like I've become more open about the thought of maybe in the future going to therapy. And I feel like there's also more comfort in talking about just even the simple things in your life that trouble you that can still be unpacked in a therapy session. So I want to talk about what was that decision like to say, you know what, I think I want to seek therapy. I want to seek that sort of help. And how has that, I guess, like shifted some of the habits that you had before? So I actually tried therapy in 2019 for the first time. And it Mm -hmm. was because I was still, I was a sophomore or junior at USC and I was in a sorority and one of my sorority friends, we were about to get lunch and then she casually just drops, oh, I'm sorry, we're going to have to reschedule. I have a therapy appointment. And that was the first time I heard someone just casually mention therapy because before it was this huge stigma around yeah. like, oh my gosh, you have to be insane you know, or something's really wrong with <laughs> yes. you. But she was the most bubbly, like loving, outgoing person. I love her to this day and I tell her about it all the time. And it was the first time where I saw, for me, a normal person just openly talking about therapy. And that really opened up my perspective of like, okay, maybe I should give this a try. So I gave it a try at the end of 2019 and I didn't have a good match with my therapist. Mm -hmm. So you broke up with the therapist. I did. (laughs) And I just, I also realized I wasn't ready because I was trying to go and I just couldn't open up. I couldn't Mm. share anything at all. And I just knew in the moment I wasn't ready. Because like you said, I think you have to be in a space where you're willing to put in the emotional, the physical, the financial work, all of that. And I just wasn't in the place to be vulnerable and open up about the things that were going on. So flash forward two years later, 2021, I 
honestly hit a rock bottom around the time in March or April of 2021 at the end of my senior year at USC. And that was when I had a really unhealthy relationship with food, really low self-esteem, self-hatred. I was going through like spurts of like depression and everything. And I realized like I was really ready and I really needed it. So that's kind of when I took the first step and it honestly has changed my life. My therapist is amazing. And I think it was such a gift from God because we realized a year later, so we never really talked about it in our sessions about faith, but I realized that she was also Christian. And I think that's so beautiful because I never really talked about faith during my therapy sessions because I didn't want to mix, you know, like faith and that. And I didn't know if that was appropriate, but it just felt even more of an encouragement. Like this is where I was supposed to be because I felt so comfortable with her. And she also understood what I wanted to do with my life, like what the meaning of life is, what my purpose is and everything like that. But it turned me from someone who always blamed myself, who hated myself, who hated all the things going on, who kind of had a victim mentality. And I was able to process all the things that I went through and in therapy, become a better person every day, take responsibility, do things like cognitive and behavioral therapy where I change my thought processes and also my behaviors mm. to become the person that I wanted to be. Yeah. And, and I've spoken to someone else in the podcast about her experience going to therapy. There's so many different modalities for therapy that it's also very important that when you're ready to like put in the work and find your therapist, find your th- perfect match to also find the best modality for you so the person that I was interviewing she talked about how somatic healing is the best for her how somatic healing it deals more with like you can kind of sense the tension or where your trauma or your thoughts are kind of stored in specific parts of your body and how you can relieve those specific tensions as a way to heal I think that's so interesting so yours is more of like a a cognitive behavioral one like can you explain what that means to someone who's interested in that mode yeah so my therapist was really focused on CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. And it focuses on uh, the cognitive part, which is your brain. So your thought processes, what you think about yourself, what you think about the world, perspective. It's all about perspective. And it was changing your thought processes. Maybe it's the words you tell yourself or the experiences you have and what perspective you have about that and what the stories you tell yourself. And then we also combine behavior. So what are physical things, whether that be Um, walking away from diet culture or not you know like stepping on the scale or not Mm. like measuring my food or those kind of behavioral things or even just the way that I would like treat myself so I think the combination of focusing on your thoughts and your actions are really powerful and that was kind of the way that I was able to just restructure like my and program my thoughts and my behaviors Mm. when you said that you were at a a very low low how your body manifested that you started breaking out like crazy and I feel like a lot of women and also like men too but I specifically I feel like in the wellness space, a lot of women like to share, it's like a lot of their acne stories. And there's so many like different variations about how people get acne. Can you tell me and the listeners, like what was making you break out? Because I know the answer to this, but I want you to share what made you start having just so much acne on your face. Yeah. So I grew up, I have great genetics. I have to say that first of all, my mom has amazing skin. My brother is a type who literally doesn't even wash his face and he has great skin. You know, (laughs) it's just so annoying. So I have to say I've grown up with pretty, pretty good skin overall. I did have some, a little bit of hormonal breakouts, but that's normal. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until last year. It was last year. Yeah. When I started breaking out like crazy. Wow. Okay. I thought it was 2021. No, it was 2022. And I thought it was because I didn't have my period for almost all of 2021. So yeah, 2021 was a rough year for sure, but that wasn't the case. It was because I had graduated from USC. I had taken the eight hour exam to apply to medical school. It's eight hours? Yeah, it's seven and a half hours. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, that's- <laughs> I studied two summers for oh it. It was gosh. horrible. <gasps> it, it was honestly, that almost tipped me over. It didn't tip me over. The thing that actually tipped me over was me working in the emergency department as a medical scribe and seeing people have heart attacks and die in front of me and have all these crazy things. And I was overworked, working eight to nine hours, barely any rest. 
and just constant go, go, go. And I, I hated what I was doing. And that was my breaking point. Um, but yeah, I took the eight hour exam. I was working in the emergency department. I was writing my applications for medical school. I was also just going through a lot of just recovering from an unhealthy relationship with food and just the hormonal changes from that. And also I have to say, I was lathering my face with jojoba oil, which is so <laughs> funny, but I was trying to go into more natural ways of skincare, of body care. Cause mm. once you, for me, I'm very passionate about like holistic health and wellness, especially mm -hmm. clean beauty and skincare. So I started freaking out about all of the products that I was using that was causing a lot of my hormone disruptions. So then I started just lathering jojoba oil all over my face. And that was such a bad idea. So the combination of putting a ton of oil on my face. Is it uh, just really thick oil that just kind of blocks your pores? Yeah, it was blocking my pores. I was very stressed I, yeah. out. I was dealing with an unhealthy relationship with food, still kind of like struggling with what I was doing. And it wasn't until I started um, obviously not using the jojoba oil, I quit my job at the emergency department, switched careers completely, which honestly made me so much happier and mm -hmm. less stressed out. And I started doing things that I was actually passionate about. And I think people don't realize, I actually did a, a post about this, the power of happiness and joy and stress. And when all of that stress went away and I started pursuing what I was doing, I my skin just started clearing up and I just started glowing from the inside out. And I've never you know, really had better skin. And people always tell me like, oh, you have such great skin. You have such great hair, X, Y, or Z. And I really think it's a combination of food. I eat a mostly plant-based diet, stress, you know, working on myself, eating healthy, working out X, Y, or Z. Yeah. But your skin is really great right now. And Thank I feel you. I also agree with you because I grew up with clear skin as well. And I also had my my acne fiasco in 2022 as well. Like, really? <laughs> what an interesting year, yeah. 2022. So what happened was that um, so I grew up with clear skin and then I didn't know I was developed. I was on the onset of developing PCOS. I had no idea. It's because I was just really lost. I was like, I don't know what's happening. Mm. So when it was the start of 2022, January, it was when I was shooting a really big pilot for a previous company that I was working at. And yeah, I mean, like, I guess I was stressed. But when I started growing like one or two zits on my on my face, I didn't think much about it because I was like, well, you know, it's it's the season of my life. I guess I'm stressed. But then I was like, wait, Melissa, but when you were stressed back then, you didn't grow any acne though. And so I didn't think much about it because it was like one or two. And then by the time March rolled around, I grew a bit more and I was like, okay, like still not that much. Like I cover it with some concealer. It's totally fine. July of 2020 rolls around and my face looks like pepperoni pizza. It was like, oh my God. it was so, I was so confused. Yeah. And like, and it really, acne really affects your confidence. Exactly. People don't like to admit it, but I, as someone who was so fortunate to have great skin, yeah. it affects your confidence so It was so like night much, and day. Right? I agree with you. And so we were really privileged growing up with clear skin, but yeah. my sister didn't grow up with clear skin. She also had cystic acne. And it was until I had that for like about a year where I was like, Martina, I yeah. get it. I get it. And I feel like a lot of people are like, there are worse problems in the world instead of acne. I was like, okay, that doesn't negate the fact yeah. that my confidence was like so low yeah. during that time. And usually I'm the type of person like, I don't really like to wear makeup. I like to put on sunscreen. Yeah. But, or like do my brows. But then when I go out, it's like, I don't really like to put on makeup. But that year was like, concealer was like my best friend. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and what I was doing wrong too is that I was over exfoliating my face and so mm. it was all these active ingredients that were like freaking my skin out and my skin is like stop over exfoliating me yeah. and so I thought that was the best way to get rid of and I was using like really harsh ingredients like salicylic acid I was just like oh putting gosh. on my face just to get rid of my zits but I was like getting a lot of scarring and it was just I was really lost until I finally started going through like holistic care um September of 2022 and my first session with my doctor she was like my tip for you is to implement five minutes of self-care. I was like, are you kidding me? Yeah. I paid this much <laughs> for this holistic membership. You did five minutes of self-care. But my goodness, mm -hmm. like mental health is also physical health. And yeah. I feel like going through functional medicine that I've realized that managing your stress is just as important as like taking specific supplements for your body. Absolutely. And in terms of nutrition too. I went, once I got my blood work done and realized that I had all of this sensitivity to like gluten and dairy because of PCOS that mm -hmm. I modified my nutrition and I work with a health coach and 
we're able to kind of see like the foods that are anti-inflammatory or the foods that will like will really nourish your body because I feel like also in college and I feel like a lot of women will relate to this too it's like you struggle a lot with food for a lot of women and I think yeah every time when I talk to my friends about nutrition I feel like in high school before we graduate we all need to take like a nutrition course Absolutely. or like in college too because also growing up in Asia and then coming to the states I just feel like I didn't have a culture shock but I had like a food culture shock I feel like like the portion sizes are different the ingredients yeah. were like worse and it was just like not the foods that I grew up eating and I feel like I was also living in the comfort of my of, in my family's home where, you know, my mom would have these meals for me where it was like home cooked meals. And I feel like eating out in Asia is a much healthier cultural lifestyle, whereas eating out here is very different. Or if you want to eat out at a healthy restaurant, it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. So coming here, I was just like I had no idea of what you know, healthy eating was like. And so I definitely struggled a lot with food. And so I feel like so many women struggle with this. A, a year later, like, I think my skin has made drastic improvements. Like it still has a bit no, of scarring. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Like, but it was really like self-care, which yeah. a year ago I'd be like, self-care. Like, I don't need that. But self-care really just doing stretches, food and like spending quality time with friends and using gentle ingredients mm -hmm. oh my gosh so you were using the jojoba oil i was using like salicylic acid and exfoliator so ladies and guys please don't overstimulate your skin yeah um yeah and there's this one very affordable brand that mm. not sponsored it. anything i've <laughs> knocked on their door multiple times but this just shows how much i love them they're called good molecules you can find them on ulta all of their products are less than $25, last many, many months, and it has changed my skin and helped a lot with scarring. It's very gentle. It's vegan, cruelty-free, has just simple ingredients. It's non-fragrance-based and super affordable. So is, so if anyone is struggling with skin, I highly recommend trying out Good Molecules. Their uh, stuff has definitely changed my skin. I will also say a, a, a big mistake that I did mm -hmm. was that so growing up my mom always told me that like tea tree oil is really good at combating acne mm -hmm. and then lavender oil is really great at um, reducing scarring or healing scarring and so I always knew that but what I did wrong was that and for people who want to like heal their acne I mistakenly thought that just buying 100% tea tree no. oil at Whole Foods was the tea tree oil I grew up using and so I was like putting on so much tea tree oil on my face every day thinking like I want my acne to go away along with like no. the salicylic acid oh and I feel gosh. like it just my skin was like what is <laughs> wrong with you like stop treating me this way and so I was putting on like 100% tea tree oil 100% lavender oil until like one day I got out of just like desperation I got like a curology monthly subscription like because your first month is like five dollars and so I told like the dermatologist that was looking at my case about like oh this is my skincare routine I sent her photos of like the tea tree oil I use and she was like okay so heads up that is a hundred percent tea tree oil <laughs> if you want to use tea tree oil you should like dilute yeah. it with some sort of oil and I think that was also a factor in making my skin freak out so people who want to buy tea tree oil or lavender oil like don't get it at Whole Foods because that's like not diluted or, or at least at diluted yeah at least dilute it yourself I <laughs> looking back I'm like oh my gosh <laughs> Melissa but I feel like in, in in desperation it makes us do like crazy, crazy things. things yeah and your skin will get better trust me I remember yeah. when my skin was horrible I I didn't know what was going on I was mm -hmm. freaking out and I you know, I would wear hats all the time. I didn't feel like going out. It really affected my confidence. But eventually you will figure it out. You will, you know, just focus on the basic things like taking care of yourself. A lot of times we're stressed out. You know, we have maybe things going on in our lives, whether it be the it could be food, the things that you're putting on your skin. It's very holistic. But I have faith that everyone is meant to have good skin. So, yeah, have faith. I agree. My sister has really good skin now, too. So but it's taking her so long and I wow a journey that teaches you a lot about what you need to change in your life because yeah. your body like your body keeps score it'll manifest any mm -hmm. stressors in your life or any habits in your life that may be keeping you off balance so I want to talk about more of like your morning routine or like your routine in general because I feel like mm -hmm. summer is coming and I think a lot of people are pressured to be once again that girl to yeah. be 
the it girl in the summer to have a hot girl summer but sometimes a lot of it can have a lot of toxic ideologies and so what is a way that you would recommend that is holistic that is kind to your body and is still striving to be the best version of yourself that works for you for example so i think there's a lot of pressure like you said to be that girl to have do all the things that she's doing and I've made this mistake before where I just try to copy and paste myself, but that's not the case. And you have to always be inspired by people instead of copying whatever that may be in life. So when I share my morning routine, I just want everyone to remind themselves not to copy what I'm doing, but realize that this is what works for me. The one thing I would want people to copy, if there's one thing that you're going to copy, I leave my phone in my living room and I charge it outside of my bedroom in my living room the night before I'll put it on do not disturb sleep mode whatever it may be I charge it in my living room walk away and I have a physical alarm clock in my bedroom my room has a no electronic kind of vibe at night Mm. so right when I wake up it's from this alarm clock that has a very soothing like chirping like they're birds or it could be a sound of waves it's on amazon for like 20 bucks wow okay okay i'll link it yes, <laughs> in the show definitely notes definitely link it um so so worth it so I'll, I'll wake up instead of my iphone doing like you know the the triggering yeah like beep 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 it'll be a very like soft calming chirping noise nature based and I'll turn it off and I don't have my phone or anything and I won't touch my phone for the first hour, which has honestly really helped with my Mm. mental health because that's time for me to just be not affected by the world and not be consumed by media, but kind of form my own thoughts, like form my own decisions. So right now I'll probably walk to the living room, sit on my couch and do some five minute gratitude. So I'll write down what I'm grateful for, what mm-hmm. my intentions are. It takes less than five minutes. You don't even need a special journal. I use a five minute journal, but you can literally use a piece of paper and mm-hmm. write down three things you're grateful for. Mm-hmm. And that focuses you to focus on all the blessings in your life. Cause I think we forget that a lot of the times. And then I will always try to read a little bit of the Bible. I'll do a little bit of devos. Mm-hmm. I'll reflect on where God wants me to wants me to be in life because for me, that's my whole purpose on this earth. And if I've missed that point, then it doesn't matter how successful I become. That's for me, not the purpose of what I'm doing. So I always try to ground myself in yeah. scripture. And right now I'm reading Psalms, which is really amazing. Psalms 23 is one of my favorite verses that I've just been meditating on. If I have time, I'll do a little bit of journaling, but nothing too much. And for me, it's really important to have this very calm, like quiet morning, nothing stressful, nothing like like get in some crazy movement first thing. Um, so then after that, I will probably eat a light breakfast and then go on a long morning walk. Mm. And it's always outside and it feels so good to just get fresh air first thing in the morning. Probably take me around 30 minutes to an hour, depending on how long it is. Yeah. And you'll listen to a podcast while you're walking. Yeah. I'll listen to a podcast. This would be a great podcast to listen to <laughs> yeah. or something very uplifting. Yeah. It could be something like how to become the healthiest version of you, or I'll listen to a podcast on healthy hormones or educate myself on a topic, but it's nothing um, like media or gossip. It's always just uplifting and empowering. Um, I'll come back and then get in my workout clothes and then go to the gym. I do have to say that this is my full-time job. So taking care of myself is part of my job. So I didn't do all of this. I also, when I was working at the grocery store, I had a 2 to 10 p.m. shift. So I was blessed enough to have the whole morning and most of my lunchtime to myself. So I understand if this isn't realistic for everyone, this is just what was what's working for me, you know, but I think the most important thing, if I could just cut it down is don't touch my phone in the morning, either write gratitude or have some type of like devotionals, have a good walk outside and get in some movement. And that is what starts my day and gets me going because even if everything goes wrong and I don't get anything productive or just things don't work out the way at least the morning goes well and I can really set my intention and be very intentional because I have to be a leader now I have to lead by example and that means taking Mm. care of myself first so if anyone wants to level up and be the super successful business person or launch their own career or make a brand or whatever it may be you have to remember that people are following you and you have to lead by example and that means you have to pour into yourself And so I think that's why I take it so seriously and I don't consider it selfish because 
I can't pour into other people if my cup is empty. Exactly. Exactly. One thing you said about not having your phone in your room is I think it's a great habit to have. And also, like, I just wonder who are the people who design like the alarm sounds because most of the alarm this is like an intrusive thought yeah. most of the alarm sounds that we hear like <laughs> I'm yeah. like if I want to wake up <laughs> feeling like nice and rested and then just to have that suddenly like click into my brain yeah. I'm like I also want to point out that a lot of the times our world produces a lot of anxiety and fast pacedness yeah and I think we have to counteract with that as much as possible that's why I create an environment that's very peaceful in my room I have a ton of plants I don't have you know my phone on me and I think it's really important not to wake up stressed first thing yeah. in the morning because your cortisol levels are actually the highest first thing in the morning and that's your stress hormones mm -hmm. and that is actually natural because it it gets your body to wake up and get up and move. Mm -hmm. So it's natural that your stress hormones are the highest, but you don't want to aggravate it even more. So I think it's really important to wake up in a very calm state if you can. Obviously, I'm single. I'm not married. I don't have kids running around. So I think I just want everyone to take it with a grain of salt and see it. I'm very lucky that I just take care of myself. Mm -hmm. But I love that, you know, and I'm, and I'm, yeah, blessed. it's the season that you're it's in. It's the right season now. that I'm in, and I, and I know that when I'm a mother, when I'm married, it might look different, but like you're saying, to just really focus on not being so stressed and anxious first thing in the morning. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, I was listening to Jay Shetty's podcast, one of my favorite podcasts. It's, uh, it's called On Purpose. And he actually does talk about how his, previous cell phone policy he used to lock his cell phone and his laptop in his car because he just had to remove those stressors and that distraction from him first thing in the morning he has a rule where like the dining room and his own bedroom that is again if you're privileged enough to have to have your office space and your bedroom separate but for him like it's just his bedroom so he's like we have a no phone policy in the bedroom and he talked about this thing where I was like huh wow you make a really good point where he says that you would never want someone to barge into your room first thing in the morning. So why are we letting hundreds, thousands of notifications pour into our phone? And that's the first thing we see in the morning. And I was like, wow, <laughs> that's a very wise statement. And so I try to, I always leave my phone on airplane mode. At times I slip and turn off airplane mode and I get sucked in. But I also do agree, like not having a phone distraction and I think having a slow morning is also really important to me as well. Like I would try to exercise first thing in the morning or I try to like also I like to do my devotions first thing in the morning. Not to say I'm perfect. I've failed many times, especially this week as well. <laughs> but that's a good mode to follow by. So hopefully people who listen are inspired to make a few adjustments in their in their life maybe buy an alarm clock and not just use your phone as an alarm clock because once you turn off the alarm clock on your phone you know, there are all your notifications. And I think for me, I used to work in a news capacity because I, I have a journalism background that I download a lot of news apps on my phone because I want to know what's breaking, like what's happening. I want to be involved. But I've had to delete a lot of these news apps and stick to only two or three because I was getting so many notifications in a day that it was really overwhelming me. And I'm the type of person I have to read every single notification too. So it was an intentional habit. I just I was like, I can't. It's also one of the reasons why I like stopped working in the news space because I think also it is a privilege to not be caught up to date with the news every single moment. And I had a taste of that in college and when I graduated and I was like, I don't think this is the space for me. So that's also something that like I've realized it just was a, a big stressor on my life too. But kind of still on the conversation of being in your holistic journey and like so many amazing things are happening in your life like so you have management now I which do. is so amazing yeah. I always love hearing stories about like how you were able to have management because and it's so crazy I feel like when I see so many creators out there and they have like their management email in their bio I feel like there's so many talent management companies out there right now because the creator economy is just so huge in this day and age for a lot of creators who are looking for management and maybe they get reached out if you know if they, oh yeah I've, I've gotten reached out to like big ones too okay that's amazing because I want to ask like for anyone who wants to get into the content creation space uh, space and want to get management what do you think are the green flags and red flags and what would you recommend as a management that you think would have a harmonious partnership with the creator themselves yeah so I debated a lot whether or not I wanted to go to a big management because 
some of them have reached out to me and I've thought about it because my manager now, she's just one person. So we have a very close relationship. We text each other every day. Um, she knows exactly what's going on. So that I think is something very special where if you have one manager on their own, whether they be freelancing, whether it may be, you have a very close relationship and you can um, text each other every day or keep in updates, whether it may be, but a bigger agency you probably are not going to have that kind of relationship. And so I think the red flag in management and the reason I haven't transitioned to a big name when I totally could is because I am nervous that I'm going to get lost in the numerous influencers that they have. And a lot of the, the times when you have a big agency, they have a certain set of like goals financially that they want you Mm. to hit so Mm. instead of being like you know what I don't want to work with this brand because I don't see them completely aligned then you might you might feel more pressure to do that because Mm. you have an obligation I also think it's really important that your manager sees your vision sees your talents and they're very um they fully support you and they want the best for you and they see your vision they see your potential and where you want to go and you also feel like they have your best interests at heart and they're excited about your content. Like they're genuinely almost a fan of your content yeah. and they understand you as like a person. They understand your message, the vibe, because you want your management literally represents you like who you are. So she filters out all of the people and she tells me, you know what, like this brand reached out or this brand wants to talk to you. And she'll immediately, now that she knows me so well, she'll know like if I say yes or not. And yeah. You want someone yeah. She's like an extension of you. Yeah. So you want someone who you respect as a person mm. as well. And you think really gets your business or your brand or just in general, but you don't have to have a manager to be super successful in what you do because who knows in a couple months, I may still have a manager. I may not, I don't know yet. I think now that I have one, I thought like everyone had to have one and that's what you kind of like you kind of make it if you have a manager right but I think I have a different perspective now where I think it's also very empowering to also do partnerships like from your own place as well Mm. I feel like in the course of your entire life this season is still fairly recent in your life Mm -hmm. and it also goes to show it's also what you shared on your account it's like your life can change in six months. It's like a, it's one of the videos you posted yeah. and you're also like living, walking, breathing testament to how your life can completely change, how the plans that you thought you might have, there's probably a better plan out there, but you just don't know it. If you were to, you know, expand sort of your wellness empire, you're willing to, you know, expand more in like have a, make a bigger mark on the, on the wellness space. Like what is next for you? Like, are you thinking of, getting I don't know certified in like holistic nutrition or are there any of those thoughts that come into your mind in terms of like having a plan for the next year or two yeah I definitely had a vision when I started this and it's honestly really changed now that I'm doing this Mm. um I I don't know exactly what I want to be building but I know that I want to build my own business whether it be a brand or a product I don't know yet I think I would also love to go into like hosting. I've always loved doing that. I've always loved talking to people and having that engagement because I think as a creator, you film so much on your own that I've really missed that social aspect. But I really just want to be a well-known like Asian American um, creator or a public figure in the wellness space and really advocate for that, advocate for mental health, um, just for wellness in general, because I don't really see a lot of Asian American content creators in the wellness space specifically. I think there's more of us maybe in the fashion, fashion, fashion. <laughs> fashion or beauty, but I've never really seen a lot of creators in the wellness, like health and wellness space. I agree. So that's something I really want to move forward in. I'm not sure exactly what that may look like, but I definitely want to build like an empire and I have really big dreams and goals and I don't want to release all of them because I think there's also something in not telling people what you want to do, but showing them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just definitely like be on the lookout for me. Like I I know like big things are going to happen. I 100% agree. Well, okay. To end our conversation, I always like to ask my guests, there are three wellness non-negotiables. It could be a thing or it can be an action. And have you kind of shared a bit about your routine, but if there was three that you could only do for the rest of your life what would those three non-negotiables be um 
for sure working out yes. i love movement it's such a form of mental health therapy you know releasing the body is amazing for your health in general and i've grown to love fitness not to morph myself into something but just because i get to you know i think there's such a beautiful thing about being able to move your body mm -hmm. so that's a non-negotiable for me um were you always an active person growing up though i was mm -hmm. i swam my entire life mm -hmm. i was an athlete so i was pretty active my entire life and i've always loved like being active so i would definitely say it kind of translated over but obviously once you go to college and you're no longer an athlete in high school I feel the same way. you know you're kind of like you're, was, you're eating the same but you're not moving the same exactly you know? and i was like yeah. i guess i just have to sprint on the on the treadmill that's like yeah. the only way to work out but oh my gosh i've i've done everything like every <laughs> yeah. type of workout and i've just realized for me i love like strength training and uh -huh. a little bit of weightlifting, a little bit of yoga a little bit of running i love everything i think my second one would definitely be reading scripture or devotionals or getting in the word mm. because for me, faith is the most important thing in my life. And without scripture and without being in the word, I would be led astray. I would start to focus on the wrong things and I would lose sight of what is actually important in my life. And it's truly given me a sense of purpose. It's given me a sense of peace and it's reminded me why I live. And it's given me so much wisdom. And, you know, you can ask so many people for advice, but at the end of the day, for me, like scripture is where I go to for wisdom and for knowledge. So that's definitely a non-negotiable for me. Yeah. One. I agree with you too. Um, I feel like this year I'm trying to be more intentional about like getting the doing my devotions first thing in the morning because okay everyone I'm a Christian girly as well Woo! which you probably know because I talked about this already but <laughs> because I'm in a season where I feel like it feels dry I feel like yeah. in terms of opportunities in terms of career and also in my health journey as well and I feel like when a lot of people and Christians and people with not within the faith as well when they think about a person being put in a really tough situation they're like oh you mean Job like you're in your Job era it's like he it's he's kind of like the textbook person of when someone is in a really hard situation but like I'm also reading like Genesis where I'm like reading about Joseph's story and I was like wait a minute I feel like everyone's talking about Joe but what about I Joseph okay this is so, <laughs> this is gonna be I'm exposing myself right now but I have a crush on Joseph <laughs> I have a crush on like, Joseph this turned into like the most interesting I feel like people not within the Christian religion they're like Oh my what gosh. is going on? Okay, you, you guys need to read Joseph's story. Like, actually read it in the Bible, not just watch the the movie. You know the kid movie? I, I know Joseph? exactly what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, it's like the Prince of Egypt or something like that. <laughs> but read the Bible, read Joseph's story, and he has the most incredible like journey mindset he's so faithful but yeah. he's all he's just like so faithful to god and he trusts him and he also trusts in his dream mm -hmm. that everyone laughs at mm -hmm. his brothers laugh at yeah they threw dad. him in a well <laughs> they like... literally tried to murder him for his dreams yeah. and i think the reason i have a crush on him is because he kind of reminds me of like who i want to be like not giving up on my dreams 100 percent. people laugh at me and this is kind of a story i kind of want to digress but yeah, please um Last year when I was working at a grocery store, I was working at Trader Joe's. Mm -hmm. Not sure if you've heard about it, <laughs> uh, but I remember it was pouring rain outside and it was my time to bring in the carts, like the grocery carts in the parking lot. It was pouring rain. It was like September or something. I had like 3,000 followers. I had spent many months creating content. I was like, what am I doing with my life? I graduated from USC and now I'm working at a grocery store pushing carts in the rain mm. like this is ridiculous it was such a low low and I felt so embarrassed but I think going back to Joseph of like not giving up on your dreams of continuing to pursue it even when you're in prison yeah even when people try to kill you yeah. and just his like willingness to stick through it all mm -hmm. and just also his story about like forgiving his family for what they've did like I've I connect so much with him and he was also a very handsome man it <laughs> yeah. says yeah, in the bible he's a, he's a man. very <laughs> handsome man okay so so if there's a Joseph out there, yeah, <laughs> that's I know. So funny, but yeah, <laughs> I do. I completely agree with you. Like, so I mean, like, I feel like people, if they're not even, if they don't identify as Christian, I feel like in general, it is a very inspiring story that you should definitely read so about. Because, inspiring. So what happened is that like he grew up and like his brothers despised him. They like threw him in a well and they sold him to Egyptian slavery. So, yeah, they sold him into slavery. He worked for Potiphar, which is like Pharaoh, King Pharaoh's like right hand man, and he worked in his household. But then Potiphar's wife completely 
um, framed him for advancing on yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. He's so, a handsome man. Yeah. So she tried to like make advances onto him, but he maintained he, he has really strong principles. He was thrown into jail and put into prison for like years until one day. It was this part of the story where I realized that when he was in prison, he was in prison with a baker and a cupbearer of Pharaoh. They were thrown into prison by Pharaoh because Pharaoh one day was like, I'm not having it with you guys. So he threw the two people into prison. So the three of them are in prison. And one day, like it was in it, well, that part of the scripture where like the cupbearer and the um, and the baker, they had these dreams and they just couldn't interpret them. But Joseph like was anointed and he like was able to define what those dreams meant to them. And so one day the cupbearer and the, the baker, they were released from prison and the dreams that Joseph foretold exactly happened. And so right before the cupbearer left the prison, Joseph told the cupbearer, "Is like, please like put in a good word with your master, with Pharaoh, that I, you know, helped you. But what happened is that the cupbearer completely forgot about Joseph. And so Joseph still stayed in prison for a very long time. And people might be confused, like, what's, what is she saying right now? But what I learned is that I feel like in the past, when I was trying to advance my career, I feel like the only way I was able to advance my career is if I cling on people with power. Yes. And I was like, if wow. I just got that one connection, wow. if I just got that person to return the favor and give me this chance. Yeah. And that has not happened. And I feel like I've been really disappointed by people I've worked with, but then have let me down. And I feel like mm. it's because they didn't give me that shot. But in that situation, I was like, I can't rely on these people for me. I have to rely on God because his divine plan is like way better than I could ever imagine. But it was like a really convicting moment for me too. I was like, Melissa, you have to stop thinking because you have to rely on this person that they're going to give you this. Like God can give you so much more. You have to stop relying on that one person who you think is going to make like your career, you know, go on an upward trend. So that is like what I felt when I was rereading that passage and I was like oh my gosh Melissa that really put things into perspective and so I feel like at this point I'm just like still meditate and just pray for joy in your life because and continue to just be excellent in what he's given you because yes. Joseph was excellent throughout all of this yeah. you know he just focused on what he was given and he didn't try to worry about other things that he couldn't control yeah um so I think that's a very beautiful you know, example that you just gave. Yeah. So I spoke, I spent so much time on it just now, but I hope people who read the spark notes version of this is just like, don't feel that you have to rely on someone to get success. I feel like God has yeah. given you the tools and he will give you the tools to succeed and to yeah. bring, have a more fulfilling life. And that is my two cents. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad that we diverted into this part mm. of the conversation. So your third tip, <laughs> my third tip. Hmm. There's so many I could say. I'm not going to say the phone thing because I've already mentioned that. Yeah. I think I'm going to mention something new that I haven't said, which is to have a healthy, well-balanced breakfast within an hour of waking up. Mm -hmm. Because For hormone health. I know so much diet culture says like eat. Don't eat within this hour. Like eat and like, you know, fast and do all these things. And I've tried every diet under the sun. I've tried intermittent fasting mm -hmm. and it just Me causes too. more stress on my body. It's so important to have something in your stomach before you take caffeine. A lot of people just wake up and drink coffee first thing yeah, in the morning. Yeah, it spikes your blood sugar. So first you're waking up with your annoying alarm clock that stresses you out. Then you go on your phone and you scroll. Then you go on your, you drink your coffee. Like you're so stressed, you know, yeah. and I think people don't realize that like, they're like, why am I unhappy? Like, why am I anxious? It's like, well, the first couple of things you do in the morning are causing a lot of nervousness um so i think that's something i would recommend is try to have um, a source of complex carbs healthy fats protein so what i what my go-to right now is um some eggs i'll have some sliced avocado and then a sweet potato or some toast something like that where everything is balanced and i just try to enjoy it within an hour of waking up and it really just helps me with my hormones with just also helping with your metabolism as well and it just starts everything up again so i definitely recommend having breakfast not being scared to to eat it like don't ever skip meals and if you do do not skip breakfast if there's just one meal to not skip it's so so important yeah and to be intentional when you're like eating with your food in the morning yeah. not having distractions yeah it's really important as exactly well. those are three really really practical tips jisoo thank you so much for coming on happy hour Aww. we've talked for almost two hours oh my gosh now. really <laughs> I didn't even, oh my gosh we have and i thank you so much for your time and i thank you so much for allowing me to come into your backyard and i thank you so much for your hospitality and for 
opening up and being vulnerable. And I feel like we've also connected on so many things. Like 2022 was a year for us. Oh, yeah. Acne was a year for us. I really appreciate your time. And I feel like I'm so glad that we're also... We also got to meet in person and I just feel like it's a really organic connection we had. I'm so grateful that you responded to my very first ever DM. So thank you for doing that. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for listening to Happy Hour with Melissa Cho. Yes, that is me. If you've made it to the end of this episode, you already know the call to action. Follow Happy Hour wherever you listen to your pods. If you've been enjoying the show so far or if you've been a long-term listener and you haven't left a review yet, You can do so by leaving a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. If you're feeling generous on Apple Podcasts and you want to leave a written review, that would be amazing as well. And also be sure to follow Happy Hour on Instagram. That is H-A-A-P-I, not H-A-P-P-I. Okay, people keep spelling the name wrong, but it is H-A-A-P-I. If you spell H-A-P-P-I, then you are not an ally. Okay, I'm rambling. So it's H-A-A-P-I, H-O-U-R-P-O-D. Happy Hour Pod. That is the Instagram where you're going to be seeing episode highlights, guest reveals, and bloopers. So be sure to follow Happy Hour on Instagram if you want any of that fun content. Anyway, okay, I'll see you next week. Bye.